All right, good afternoon, everybody. If you could please take, uh, take your seats. Um, I am delighted to uh, introduce our uh, second Titan speaker of this conference, um, Professor Peter Glynn, who is the Thomas Ford Professor in the Department of Management Science and Engineering in the School of Engineering at Stanford University. He is a fellow of INFORMS as well as a fellow of the uh, Institute of Mathematical Statistics. He's had a long and happy association with uh, the simulation community. For example, he was a co-winner uh, of uh, three best publication awards from the Informed Simulation Society in 1993, 2008, and 2016. He was a 2010 co-winner of the Informed's John von Neumann Prize, uh, the Theory Prize. He was uh, elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2012, and he's made many significant uh, contributions to the foundations of stochastic simulation, queuing theory, and statistical inference for uh, stochastic processes. Um, in particular, uh, to our community, contributions to simulation output analysis and underlying stochastic process theory, uh, simulation-based optimization, and uh, he's done some very interesting uh, applications as well to areas like finance. Um, my, my favorite story about Peter was actually told by Barry Nelson at a workshop a couple of years ago. He was stuck on a problem. He didn't know what to do, and then he said to himself, what would Peter Glynn do? And that led him through a thought process. He solved his, he solved his problem, and he said, see, Peter doesn't even have to be anywhere near where <laughs> you are to be solving problems. <laughs> so, um, so with that sort of magical powers, <laughs> I'd uh, like to welcome uh, Peter to the stage. Thank you, Peter, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, based on that story from Barry, I'm wondering whether I should stay as far away from my PhD students as possible from now on, so they can be as creative as possible. Uh, any case, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to this WSC audience about the area of simulation. It's an area in which I've worked for many years, and I'm going to share some perspectives with you today uh, with regard to the interaction between simulation and a couple of area, other areas that I've worked extensively in, namely uh, stochastic modeling and statistics. So uh, I mentioned a moment ago that uh, I've been in the field for many years. Just to give you a sense of how many years, I'll show you now a picture of what the computers looked like when I started in the field. Well, uh, they weren't quite like this, but this is roughly the same size as the computers that I started with in the field, the mainframes of that era. But I think those computers actually had electricity and stuff like that. So, any case, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about the type of modeling that this community does. I'll call it WSC-style modeling. I'm going to be focusing on simulation, but as I said a moment ago, I'm also going to be talking about the interaction between simulation and stochastics and statistics. Uh, and hopefully share some perspectives, some ideas, some thinking about this, some conceptual notions that maybe you can carry away with you and think more about after this talk. So I'm going to do this in the context of some of the key trends that we've been uh, seeing within our community over the last years. Uh, we're in a setting now in which much more data is being acquired by corporations and public entities and various other uh, settings. Uh, and we can expect that uh, trend to accelerate in the years to come. We are only at the very beginning, probably, of the Internet of Things, and there's going to be more and more granular data in lots of other different settings that will become available to making better and better decisions. We've also seen over the last five or ten years uh, how important machine learning has become, and that is probably a trend that will continue growing in importance. Uh, the uh, machine learning area has already enjoyed a number of important successes. Uh, I'll say a little bit about machine learning and its interactions with simulation later in this talk. And another uh, trend that I think we are in the beginning stages of is computing platforms with really large numbers of cores, maybe in the hundreds or thousands or beyond that, conceivably. 
And uh, given the nature of simulation, the nature of Monte Carlo, that uh, provides us with enormous opportunities for parallelization and various other things, that probably will have a big impact on the way we do computation in decades to come. I'm not going to really talk much about that today, but it's a very exciting opportunity for our field. All right, so what am I going to talk about today? I'm first of all going to talk about modeling in the presence of no data whatsoever. <laughs> then I'm going to talk about modeling with some data, modeling with lots of data, and then I'll talk a bit at the end about scenario-based modeling. So you may wonder, uh, why is it that I'm going to talk about modeling with no data at all? I mean, it may feel like, how is that relevant to the world of simulation? But in fact, I'm going to argue that this is something that we all take for granted in a lot of the modeling and simulation-related thinking that we do. So <clears throat> why do we do modeling with no data? What is the value of models with no data? Well, it's really a starting point for thinking about systems design. Theoretical models, models not informed by data, very stylized, very descriptive models, are really models that help clarify what the main issues are in thinking about good systems design for a service operations facility, for a computing uh, environment, for in the context of finance, many other settings as well. Now when we build and think about models that have no data whatsoever present within them, uh, we accept the fact that we are not building this model for predictive purposes. We're not going to take the predictions that come out of these models uh, as being quantitatively accurate. We're not thinking about these models as being correct to within 5% or probably even 10%. We're hopefully gaining qualitative insights out of these models that will help us uh, and help synthesize the types of policies, the types of uh, system structures that we should be building in order to give uh, good results in the real world. And of course, since this is a world of no data, there's no real role for statistics in what I'm going to describe in the next few slides. So I'm going to start with a model that probably is known to many of the people in this room, the so-called MM1Q. It's a stylized single server system. You have arrivals to the system at rate lambda. There's an infinite capacity waiting room, a single server operating at rate mu1. When customers uh, come into the system, they're processed first in, first out. When they leave, they exit the system. The standard assumptions that are made here in order to make it tractable is that we have a Poisson process describing the arrivals. Now, as we all probably know, Poisson processes are actually quite reasonable starting point descriptions for many real world systems. In fact, there are a fair number of real world arrival processes that are well fit statistically by Poisson processes. But the big flaw in this model is the assumption of exponential service times. It's almost never the case that exponential service times well describe service time requirements. This is a big fiction, so we can't really expect this type of model to accurately predict quantitative behavior of this type of model. This type of stylized model can be useful, for example, in the context of looking at a production facility. You can think about the customers arriving to the system as being orders. Orders queue up uh, at the production facility. They're uh, uh, they're, they're produced at rate mu1 according to that exponential distribution after which they leave. So this system is describing the number of orders queued up at this production facility. And what is it that we learn from this model that's useful to us as simulationists, as simulators, is, for example, this basic insight, again an insight that probably almost everybody in this room is familiar with. Uh, this is the standard uh, graph of L, L being uh, a standardized notation for mean numbers of customers in the system in equilibrium. That's known through Little's law to be proportional to mean time and system. And so what we're seeing in this uh, graph is that mean time and system has a explosive behavior as the parameter rho goes to one. And what is the parameter rho? Rho is the utilization of this facility. So the proportion of time that this production facility is busy. And what we see in uh, this uh, graph is something very important from a managerial perspective. Namely, there's no way to increase utilization to get close to 100% utilization without having disastrous customer quality of service as indicated through order fulfillment time, for example. So if you want to have high utilization, you're going to have unhappy customers. Uh, if you're going to have uh, 
Uh, lots of very happy customers are probably going to have to run the system at fairly low utilization. So there's a trade-off issue there. And that's an important thing that's communicated by this model, even though we probably would never take the predictions of this model from a quantitative standpoint, the actual L computed from this model as being a particularly predictive of what you would see in a real system. You have to go to more complicated models, things like the types of models that we would simulate in this community to get things that are appropriately predictive. Let me go to a second example. This is an example of a network of queues. Now you've got a system where you have multiple points in the system where there can be congestion, where there can be queues forming. In this case, you have four different places, four different stations at which queues can form. Again, you assume Poisson arrival processes. And again, this model assumes exponential service time requirements. And this is a model that was already introduced as a network model back in the 1950s by Jim Jackson. Uh, first paper was in 1957 on single class networks. Then there's a follow-on paper in 1963 uh, in which he looks at a multi-class version of this that was intended to be used for job shop modeling and various other things in that, uh, at that time. All right, so that's the basic Jackson network model. And uh, the lovely thing that uh, Jackson discovered was that this was a system in which a product form equilibrium distribution existed. And uh, this product form distribution is a, a celebrated result in the world of uh, stochastic modeling. Uh, it makes the computation of the equilibrium very, very simple and straightforward for this class of network models and makes them very, very tractable. Now, one interesting point to this is how this structure was identified. And uh, it's not something that you can easily find in literature. I've looked at a bunch of different places in literature over the last uh, week or two trying to find the history of this. But fortunately, I have a colleague, Mike Harris from the business school, who tells me that he spoke to Jim Jackson personally. And Jim Jackson said that simulation actually played a very important role in identifying this product for him. So in particular, in the 1957 paper, that paper is all about single class networks. The more uh, the multi-class version of this, the one that's relevant to job shops, that has a much more uh, complicated and realistic routing structure for jobs through the network. And in that context, he wasn't sure that product form would be appropriate. And he actually did simulations, and the simulations seemed to verify that, in fact, you did have product form also in this case, and he was later able to verify that mathematically. So this is a lovely instance of uh, simulation as a discovery tool. I mean, I think many people in this room that uh, are academics or not have explored many, many different theoretical questions that have come uh, up by doing simulations, either to try to uh, validate the uh, theoretical assertion that they're trying to uh, push on, or potentially to find counterexamples, either one. Simulation turns out to be a very, very useful tool in uh, the discovery process of looking at, at structure. Now, what are the insights that you get even from this Jackson network as it stands? Uh, there are several important insights that one takes away from this that are useful from a design standpoint. One is that it establishes the stability region for this class of networks. So that is the set of arrival and departure, the set of arrival and service rates for this uh, network under which we have an equilibrium. That means that the uh, system is then appropriately sized, capacitated, to be able to handle the incoming work uh, for that particular set of arrival rates and service rates. Now, in applying a model like this, it's often the case that one doesn't have an exact sense of what the arrival rates and service rates are. One only has a, a very uh, general sense of what those rates might be. So one really is looking for robust solutions that means that one really wants stability in as large a stability region as possible because you're not quite sure in designing the system what the actual arrival rates and service rates are going to end up being. So in preliminary uh, modeling of a system like this, it's quite convenient to build a model like this to try to build something where you can get some sense of what the stability region looks like. And then the other lovely thing that comes out of this model is that it also identifies four stable networks where the bottlenecks are going to be, the bottleneck stations. That means the stations where the most customers will queue up for service, where there'll be the most congestion. Those are obviously the stations where you want to add the most uh, additional resources to try to 
make the system run as smoothly as possible. And uh, again, that's a lovely insight that you can then carry on to more detailed, more granular simulations that you do that are realistic, where you actually are aiming for some level of quantitative predictiveness. So in building models like this, obviously there's an underlying tacit assumption that the conclusions are robust in the sense that if the conclusions, roughly speaking, hold uh, for these simplified models, hopefully the same structures and the same conclusions will roughly hold for more complicated, more granular systems. Okay, my third illustration of this point uh, is a very important uh, technology that was developed back in the 1970s, the so-called Aloha Net Random Access Protocol. It was the first distributed communication protocol, I think, that was uh, uh, produced and actually implemented in the real world. It was a precursor to the Ethernet, in particular, to Ethernet protocol. And uh, it was developed in Hawaii, hence the name Aloha Net. Uh, it was intended to basically uh, link all of the different University of Hawaii campuses on the different islands to the mainframe in Honolulu. And uh, the way that the communication between these different uh, computers, these different facilities across the different islands worked was that there was a single communications channel. And the way the communications channel worked was as follows, that when two campuses, for example, wanted to send packets at the same time, then there would be a co collision if they wanted to send at the same time. In that case, no transmission would occur. That means that if you want to successfully transmit packets to the, net, to the, uh, to the other campus, you're going to need to retransmit. And then there was a randomized communication protocol. In particular, uh, after k subsequent slots, users would attempt to transmit with a given stochastic probability, pk. In the context of the Aloha net, the pk was constant as a function of k. In the Ethernet, pk decays as 2 to the minus k. Anyway, they did some uh, uh, Poisson process analysis of a very simplified version of this protocol, and then they did some simulations before actually implementing the Aloha net. And the simulations uh, indicated that you had stability at least when the arrival rate was small enough, le less than some critical value lambda sub c. That's due to Abramson, who was one of the PIs on building the Aloha net back in the 1970s. Now, uh, unfortunately, the simulations were wrong. This is actually a case where these, this network is actually unstable for all values of lambda. It can be made stable for uh, at least small values of lambda if instead of allowing infinitely many retrials, you cut it off after some value of k. So I think in the Aloha net, the way it was actually implemented was that you only got 16 chances at being able to retransmit a packet after 16 chances, the packet gets dropped. So the problem here is that the simulation just didn't run long enough to see the instability. This system basically exhibits what might be called quasi-equilibrium behavior for a very, very long amount of time until the system gets into some random configuration, some random state that causes the system to take off and become unstable. So. By the way, uh, doing simulations to look at stability questions for communications protocols and various other things, that has a long history in the world of electrical engineering and, and communications network engineering. And the whole question of how to use simulation to validate, to look at stability questions is a one where I think there's a relatively small literature. Uh, it's a hard problem. There's probably more to be done in that particular space. Now I'm going to turn to modeling with some data. And the modeling with some data <coughs> is really uh, probably talking about the principal domain that uh, most people in this room uh, typically work with. So now we have some data, but maybe not as much data as we would like. And, well, there we go. All right. So now we're set, heading into the realm where we actually do expect the models to be roughly uh, predictive of quantitative performance. So we're hoping at the end of the day that when we do our simulations and we compare against uh, the real system, that we're, let's say, within 5% or 10% of the actual numbers uh, across most values of the parameters. Well, if you want to get uh, systems that are going to predict at that level of accuracy, we're going to need to calibrate the model to uh, the existing data. Uh, we can't expect 
the system to, for, to uh, predict real performance unless it gets calibrated to the real data that will be feeding into this system. And of course, uh, the most standard way of calibrating models to existing data is to use statistical methodology. It's not the only way, by the way. You can also just use some ad hoc goodness of fit criteria to fit an input model to the existing data. But the uh, most elegant, at least uh, uh, philosophically elegant ways of doing this typically are to use statistical methods. Statistical methods also have the advantage that you can do hypothesis testing and various other things that would be hard to do with a more ad hoc approach to fitting input models. So this is an area where we do indeed have a real interplay now between statistical ideas, stochastics, and simulation. Now, by the way, when I use the term stochastics for the purpose of this talk, I'm talking about that part of the probability theory community that develops theory for the types of models that WSC uh, types are interested in. So this is theory for Q's theory for, in the context of finance theory, uh, that relates to uh, discrete event dynamical systems, things of that kind. So I'm going to discuss this interplay within the setting of uh, something quite simple in the setting of arrival process modeling. So here we have uh, an arrival process with little dots correspond to arrival times. So this is what people in the probability community would call a point process. And this type of arrival modeling arises in many, many different contexts. So just to give you a, a quick sense, uh, in the context of uh, service operations. This could be orders to a fulfillment center of the kind that maybe Amazon or Walmart might be uh, running. Could be calls to a call center for an airline or a, a bank. Could be arrivals to an emergency room at a hospital. Could be all kinds of different service operations applications that give rise to this type of arrival process modeling. Now let me illustrate uh, this, this interplay issue that I, I want to get to in the context of a specific data set. And this is a data set that uh, is courtesy of Avi Mandelbaum at the Technion. So this is a data set corresponding to a very large US call center. Uh, and it sits in a data repository called Data Mocha. And what we see on this uh, slide is uh, the time of day uh, number of arrivals per half hour plotted against the 48 uh, half hours of the day. And this is a very heavily utilized call center in particular, the arrival counts in the middle of the day between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. roughly correspond to 6,000 to 7,000 arrivals per hour. So if you translate that into seconds, that's about two arrivals per second over those hours of the day. That's pretty clear from that uh, picture that a dominant uh, effect in this type of model is to take into account time of day effects. And this very simplest model that uh, we have for doing that that also incorporates some degree of randomness is a non-stationary Poisson process. So that's a process in which the uh, arrival rate as a function of time of day is some function lambda of t. And in particular, lambda of t describes the likelihood of a uh, arrival in the interval t to some t plus delta t with delta t being very small. So that's axiom number one is that there's a time of day intensity. And then the second axiom is that uh, the number of arrivals in disjoint intervals is independent of one another. So for example, the number of arrivals between 10 a.m. and noon is independent of the number of arrivals between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. So it's a process with independent increments, as people would say, in the world of probability. Now this model actually does not work well for the US call center uh, data set. And the reason is that that data set exhibits much more variability than does a Poisson process. And the way that easiest way to validate that, and probably again something that many people here are familiar with, is to just do a simple comparison of the sample variance, let's say on the counts, the number of arrivals between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Compute the sample variance, compute that to the, compare that to the sample mean for 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And what one will see is that uh, the sample variance is way bigger than the sample mean. If you have a Poisson process, those two values should be in agreement. Sample variance should be equal to sample mean, or variance population variance should be equal to population mean. And so the data uh, is clearly suggesting that there's much more so-called over dispersion in the US call center data set than what you see in a typical Poisson process. 
Now that is a, a, a big issue in this context. It's not, uh, you're never going to get good predictive behavior out of a simulation model if the simulation model doesn't exhibit that additional variability. So that has to be built into the simulation model if you have any hope of getting predictions that are, let's say, within 5% of truth. Now, uh, when you build a statistical model, uh, typically you have to decide on what features of the data set are things that you want the statistical model to represent. There's no way that a statistical model can represent every feature that's present in the data set. If you wanted to do that, you basically have to use the trace data itself. In other words, you have to use the empirical data to perfectly replicate what's present in the observed data. So uh, people make decisions about what they want to replicate. Might be that you want to replicate the marginal distributions of the inter-arrival times in the data. Might be that you want to replicate the tail behavior of service times in the system. You choose a few features that you want to see well replicated, and that's how you do statistical uh, model fitting. Now, one of the points that I want to make in today's talk is that uh, stochastics, the world of stochastics, uh, tells you important things about the features of the data that you should be trying to replicate in your statistical model. And I want to illustrate that, first of all, with this uh, call center data set. First of all, <clears throat> let's ask, what does the theory say about this setting? Well, if you're going to answer this question, it better be that you uh, decide on which of the different theories that are available you apply. And the natural vehicle in this context is what people in the world of stochastics might call a high-intensity arrival process that is arriving to a system with many servers, so-called so -called many server queue. Uh, now, uh, one of the loaded words in here is high-intensity arrival process. So what does high-intensity mean? Well, one interpretation of that is the arrival rate is high, but that's actually probably not a good uh, operational interpretation for what high, arri high arrival rate means. So in particular, if I have 7,000 arrivals per hour, that translates, as I said earlier, to roughly two arrivals per second. Well, I have either the number 7,000, well, that seems big, or I have the number two, that seems small, but I'm describing exactly the same arrival process. It's just a question of which rate, which units I'm using as uh, units of time. So high arrival rate by itself is a meaningless comment, a meaningless uh, way of thinking about the world. You have to think about high arrival rate relative to something else. It has to be calibrated relative to some scale. And what's the appropriate scale in a many-server system? it's to look at the arrival rate relative to the mean service time. So it turns out for this US call center data set, if you look at the data, the typical arrival times are in the order of three or four minutes. That translates to roughly 500 arrivals per service time at a arrival rate of about two per second. That means that you have an enormous number of arrivals per service time. That's what we mean in this context as a high intensity arrival process. Now, what's the theory that goes with this? The theory that goes with this is a, a bunch of limit theorems that people have developed over the years to look at systems like this. So the uh, limiting approximation that people have studied is one involving the number and system process, Q. And to make this uh, pr a process tractable, one takes a limit. And the limit in this context is to send the uh, intensity n to infinity, so we now have a sequence of processes q sub n, and so we're now thinking about a q nth system in which the number of arrivals, roughly speaking, per service time is about n arrivals per service time. Now what happens in this system when n is big? When n is big, this approximation says q n behaves roughly the same way that z does. Now the key point in this result, the left-hand side we can now ignore, the interesting point in this is the Z process. What does the Z process look like? The Z process is describing QN for large values of the intensity. And you look inside what the Z process has sitting there. It depends on the original problem data for this many server system only through one set of uh, parameters. And that is the variance at the time scale of uh, service times and the covariance structure at the time scale of service times. Now service times in this context are in the order of minutes, not seconds. So this theorem is saying 
that the fine structure of the arrival process down at the level of inter-arrival times, down at the level of seconds or fractions of seconds, that's irrelevant to the behavior of the system when uh, you have a high intensity uh, uh, a mini server system. What's relevant to the performance of this system, QN here being number and system process, is the covariance structure and the variance structure at the time scale of service times. So it lifts you from being in the weeds at the level of trying to fit inter-arrival processes down at the level of marginals and things like that. It lifts you up to a much higher plane of analysis, namely you should be doing your statistical analysis at the level of minutes, not at the level of seconds. So all of the stuff about fitting marginals at the level of uh, seconds, at least for this type of model, uh, doesn't seem uh, particularly relevant to performance based on this theoretical result. Now, <coughs> let's actually do a little uh, simulation to validate this. And the simulation is going to be the following. I'm going to take the data from that U.S. call center, the trace data from that U.S. call center, and I'm going to run it through a simulation. So this is going to be a simplified simulation that uh, runs in three different cases. Case number one is that we'll take the trace data itself and run it through a system that has many servers and a reasonable distribution for the service times. Case two is I'll take the trace data and I'll split the trace data up into intervals of length x. For example, let's say three minutes. So I'll split time up into units of three minutes, one three minute interval, another three minute interval, and so forth. And then I'll redistribute the arrivals from the trace in every such interval as IID uniforms. So just to illustrate this, imagine that between 11 a.m. and 11.03 a.m., the trace says that uh, there were 431 arrivals that occurred in that three minute interval. Now I take those 431 arrivals and I uh, randomize the location of those 431 arrivals across the three minute interval according to IID uniforms. So that's case number two. Case number three is I'll take those 431 arrivals that come out of the trace and I'll slot them in at equally spaced intervals through the three minutes. So basically one over every 431th of a three minute interval, you'll see an arrival. And then in the three simulations, I'm obviously gonna synchronize the service times so that they all get exactly the same service times and let's compare performance, basically sample path by sample path. And here's what happens. Uh, when you actually look at uh, what comes out of a simulation using these three different uh, cases, case one being the actual trace data itself, case two being uh, uniformly redistributed, case number three being three minute deterministically redistributed through these three minute slots, what you see is that these histograms, for example, for uh, waiting time of customers in this uh, many server model basically look almost identical from one case to the next, which is communicating, I think, in a pretty strong way that what you do at the micro scale down inside those three minute slots is having essentially no impact on system performance. Now, if you go to longer intervals of time, here's six minutes, now you're beginning to see some differences between the three cases. When you go to 12 minutes, you see significant differences in these histograms. So at the level of three minutes, uh, basically, uh, all of the microstructure that's sitting inside the three minute interval counts is irrelevant. If you can statistically model what happens in each successive three minute interval, you're gonna get very, very good replicability relative to the actual trace. So that suggests that you should focus your statistical modeling effort on what happens at the three minute scale. Now notice that this uh, simulation actually teaches us something important. The limit theorem that I described earlier says that roughly speaking, we should be thinking about uh, looking at the covariance structure and statistics of the arrival data at the level of minutes. But the theory doesn't tell you, should that be one minute that I should use? Should it be five minutes that I should be, be using? Should it be 10 minutes, 20 minutes? But doing this simulation tells you something quite specific from a recommendation standpoint. It suggests three minutes is basically the sweet spot uh, you can basically ignore a fine structure at smaller scales than that. Uh, when you get up to 12 minutes, for sure, you're getting significant uh, impacts. This aggregation doesn't work at that scale. So the simulation, this through the queue simulation that I did with a simplified model, 
that you can do prior to actually executing your final, your, your finally uh, granulated simulation in which maybe you have skill-based routing, lots of other things built into the simulation to make the system realistic. Uh, doing this preliminary analysis with a simplified model uh, can be quite useful, I think, in terms of uh, identifying the appropriate scale at which to uh, do statistical analysis. So there's strong evidence in this context that uh, inter-arrival time modeling is irrelevant for high-intensity systems. That leads us to this whole uh, notion of top-down modeling versus bottom-up. Bottom-up would be start from the smallest time scale, that of inter-arrival times build up from there. This is suggesting start at a higher level of granularity, the three-minute uh, time scale, and try to build at that level instead. So the theory, I think, pointed us in the right direction in this example. So what I'm trying to get at here is that the theory suggests the features of the arrival data that need to be captured well by the statistical model. Uh, and uh, again, another important point in this example is the through the queue experiment that guides us to the correct choice of interval duration is a key idea in this setting. Now I want to turn to another example. This is something that we've all, probably many of us, most of us here today, have experienced in the last couple of days and coming here and we'll experience tomorrow when we go back to uh, our home cities is that of airport security lines. So here is a picture of an airport security line. We're all familiar with these things. Uh, just as a, to, to put some concreteness into this, imagine that you have four servers in parallel. What are the servers in this context? Those are the X-ray machines. What are the mean arrival times? Well, we have roughly 12 arrivals to the security line per minute. It's about, uh, arrival times are roughly five seconds. And now what is the service time in this context? The service time, I would say, the principal source of uh, waiting in this system is at the x-ray machine itself. How long does it take to put a uh, given person's baggage through that x-ray machine? Well, based on what I saw at San Francisco Airport uh, a couple of days ago, it was something over, let's say, 16 seconds. All right, so what you see in this case is mean inter-arrival time and mean service time are roughly comparable in size. This is not like the many server system that we saw earlier, the high intensity arrival environment. This is what uh, people in the world of queuing theory would call a system in heavy traffic. And um, here's what the theory says about a system in heavy traffic. There's a limit theorem up at the top of the slide, which is a bit of gobbledygook. So I'll tell you what the high level uh, interpretation of this is. It says that uh, when the utilization is close to 100%, and I think you know, when you go to a uh, security line in the at busy times of the day, yes, that system is very, very heavily utilized. That's definitely a system in heavy traffic. And what it says is that uh, the uh, time scale over which the number and system process, the number and system process is unfortunately us waiting in the line, waiting to get through that airport security system. That system tends to fluctuate randomly, but it fluctuates on quite a long time scale, a time scale on the order of one over one minus rho squared, where rho is the utilization, and you know, again, utilization is typically gonna be very close to one. That means that the, uh, and it turns out that that's reflected in the limit process X. Limit process X has a covariate structure which basically replicates what you see at the scale of one over one minus rho squared. So again, you see a picture that's quite similar to that in the many server context that the uh, statistical features that are important in a system that's heavily loaded are not statistical features that have to do with uh, marginals of inter-arrival times and things like that. What it really has to do with when systems are very heavily loaded is the variance of the number of customers arriving, roughly speaking, over scales of one over one minus rho squared. Now that's a much longer scale than individual inter-arrival times and service times. Now how would you measure that one over one minus rho squared in practice? Well, one thing you could do the next time, well, tomorrow when you go to the airport and you're standing in the line, you can look at the fluctuations of this uh, number and system process, number of people waiting, and you can look at uh, that process fluctuating up and down, fix some uh, number, like uh, let's say the uh, mean number in system, let's say it's uh, 30 people waiting, and look at the time that it takes for that system to fluctuate up and down between successive visits to level 30. 
So that time, the time between those successive visits to level 30, roughly speaking, will be measuring 1 over 1 minus rho squared. That roughly is the time scale over which you need to be getting good statistical uh, feature building in whatever statistical model you build for arrivals to this type of congested system. So if you want to, that's something that you can do when you have an existing system. If you have a prospective system that you're thinking about building, how would you figure out what the 1 over 1 minus rho squared is? You could again do a through the Q simulation of the type that I described earlier in the many server context. All right, let me go to illustration number three, uh, building input models that incorporate uh, tail risk. We have uh, lots of settings where we need to make decisions that depend heavily on the tail behavior of the input. This occurs in the context of finance and looking at value at risk, conditional value at risk, portfolio optimization with downside constraints. So here the distribution that we're drawing might be the change in value of some uh, financial asset uh, over the period of one month, and this might be a histogram of that. Could be that we're uh, engineers and we're trying to do infrastructure design, so we're trying to build a bridge that uh, will survive floods, seismic hazards, and so forth. And just to make things specific, imagine that we're looking at seismic hazards, and what we're recording here is a histogram of the largest earthquake recorded in the area that that built bridge is being built within, uh, within a one-year interval. So most of the quakes that will be felt in a one-year interval will be small, so there's a lot of mass there, and then there are occasional big earthquakes that create these outliers further out. Now, in the context of that bridge example, uh, I'm going to give you uh, the specific design criteria that were actually used for the design of the San Francisco Bay Bridge that was uh, finished and open to traffic back in 2014. So that was a replacement bridge for the bridge that was heavily damaged in the Loma Prieta earthquake in the 1980s. So the design uh, criteria for that bridge is that the San Francisco Bay Bridge was, is intended to survive all earthquakes over the next 1,500 years with a probability of 95%. Now, if you think about that, that means the bridge will fall down in any 1,500-year interval with probability 5%. So. Roughly speaking, to see the first uh, bridge failure, to see an earthquake of that size that would cause a bridge failure would take 20 times 1,500 years, 30,000 years. So basically, this is a one in 30,000 year kind of event that we're talking about. And how much uh, historical seismic data do we have in the Bay Area? Well, at best, maybe 200 years. That's how long there have been significant populations living in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we're trying to extrapolate out way beyond any data that we have actually have available. And a key point that I want to make in looking at this type of risk is the following point that I think is uh, probably obvious to all of us intuitively. Namely, if you look at n years of data, the only events that you can typically expect to see in n years of data are events having a likelihood of occurring of roughly 1 over n or larger. So in order to see events in the data set that are uh, 1 in 30,000 year uh, likelihoods, you need to have at least multiples of 30,000 years of data available, which we have nothing close to. So the key point that I think is important that to, to, to recognize here is that to handle events having a smaller probability than 1 over n, the only way you can do this is via a model. In other words, it just can't be that the data alone can drive these types of decisions. These decisions are going to get largely driven by the type of model that you adopt. So in the context of looking at tail risks, the standard thing that uh, people do is they do tail extrapolation. So we fit something that extrapolates the tail hopefully well. There are a couple of obvious ways of doing this as pragmatic engineers. One, both uh, ideas involve using linear, essentially linear regression. So the question is, what regression variables do you use? So one linear regression you could do would be to, uh, to to basically uh, regress the log of the survival function f bar of x against x. That corresponds to an exponential tail that you're modeling. The other thing <coughs> that you could do is you could try to regress the log of the survival function against the log of x, and that gives you Pareto-style uh, tails that you're fitting to the distribution. Now, uh, unfortunately, there typically isn't much 
data in the tails, that's why we call them the tails. And uh, so which the choice of which model you are going to use is not going to be guided by a whole lot of data. And frankly, the linear regression itself, well, there are not that many variables, not, not that many observations out in the tail. So that, again, is going to be something that uh, is going to have a lot of noise and uncertainty associated with it. Unfortunately, that's life in dealing with this type of situation. There's no way to avoid some sort of extrapolation in the tail. And when you do it, it's going to be very noisy, fraught with lots of problems. So by the way, these two particular ways of doing extrapolation are supported by theory, in particular extreme value theory. Extreme value theory talks about the typical behavior of maxima over long intervals of time. And there's a, as I'm indicating in this slide, there's a sort of uh, way that the uh, maximum would extrapolate to multiples of time n, kn in particular, based on what happens over a typical interval of size n. So at some level, you can look to these two limit results, these two approximation results, as being things that should be reflected in the data that you have if these models are roughly correct. Now, these models uh, depend heavily on the stationarity of the data. So in particular, they may not be appropriate for climate-related risk. If you believe in uh, global climate change, which I do, frankly, then we have to worry about what's going to happen in the 21st century with regard to uh, non-stationarity in the way our climate works. That means, for example, that if you're looking at bridge design in the context of flood risk, well, floods on rivers are likely to change in all kinds of maybe unpredictable ways over the, the uh, rest of the 21st century. So applying these extrapolation methods is fraught with even more danger in the context of uh, using these ideas in that setting. And they may also not be appropriate in some finance settings. In particular, when markets move enough, so in particular in financial meltdowns, then you get lots of previously unobserved behaviors occurring. And people in the financial markets often will talk about this as now we've unleashed the animal spirits of the market. Now people are no longer behaving in the way that they've traditionally behaved because a lot of the hedging strategies that they've been using are based on sort of typical statistical fluctuation of the financial markets. Things are no longer moving according to those statistical laws. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, all of, lots of hedges begin to fall apart and all kinds of uh, weirdness begins to ensue that is, I think, largely unpredictable through uh, model-based methods. So conclusion that I'll just uh, put up here, this is my own personal view, is can we reliably predict risk in unstable financial markets? I would say probably not. And you just don't have the data available to be able to do that. And uh, the financial markets move enough from one meltdown to the next that uh, there's a lot of non-stationarity here. Now let me talk about modeling with lots of data. Here you have so much data that one could potentially use the observed data itself to drive the simulation. That leads to the world of trace-driven simulations. And uh, I think that's an attractive way of uh, potentially running simulations when you have a lot of data available. But I do want to offer some caveats. And the biggest caveat is, is the entire trace that you're using actually representative of future behavior? And in the world of finance, people definitely would take the view that uh, no, the entire trace, well, the entire trace, if you're looking, for example, at uh, let's say IBM. IBM has been around for a very, very long time as a company. And you look at its uh, stock behavior over the last uh, 50 years. I there's no way that uh, the uh, uh, trading environment that IBM functions in today with uh, all of the high frequency trading, the mutual funds, various other th things that are playing a role in the market today. None of that was present in the same uh, way back uh, 50 years ago. So when people uh, do uh, financial modeling, they would never use the entire trace. People might use the last five years of data. Sometimes for various purposes, they might use the last 90 days of data. They're not going to be using the full trace because the full trace is not really representative of future behavior. Now you're back in a limited data environment again, if you do that. Now you're back in a world where you don't, where you need to be thinking about statistics and things of that kind. Uh, another uh, problem that can occur in this context is that there could be a hidden non-stationarity in the data. If you look at the, uh, the uh, call center data that I was uh, discussing earlier, that was uh, representative of three years of uh, US call center data. Actually, if you look inside that data set, you can see that there's a small background secular trend 
increasing call rate into that call center. That means that, uh, for example, if you're using that three years of data to predict what's going to happen another year out, well, you really need to incorporate that linear trend also into what's going on. That's extremely difficult to do in a trace-driven simulation. And when you've got trends that you want to build into what happens in the future, you really are back to having to do statistically oriented model building because there are no easy ways to do that using traces. Uh, <coughs> related issues in the context of real-time prediction. So let's go back to the call center setting. You have a call center uh, that's heavily loaded. We ask the question, how congested will the call center be in another 30 minutes? So this is a real-time situation. You might want to answer that using a trace-driven simulation, but uh, now you have to ask yourself the question, the call center is heavily loaded. That's probably because there's some unpredicted burst that we're in the middle of. So what you really want to be using when you uh, look at uh, how the system's going to behave over the next 30 mis minutes congestion-wise is you need to be thinking about, I want to be sampling from within a burst. That means you want to, at some level, do a conditional trace simulation. That, again, is very hard to do using trace-based methods. So trace-based simulation is a very attractive thing to do, but there are lots of settings in which it's hard to implement. Now, this gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, machine learning alternatives to simulation. Here is a clear setting in which machine learning can be useful. Namely, you could build a neural net to predict congestion metrics based on all of the available observed features and then just evaluate the neural net to obtain real-time predictions. So this is a setting where uh, machine learning is potentially in competition with doing real-time simulation. I don't think it's clear in these operational contexts which of these different methods is going to be best long term. We're sort of waiting for the answer, looking at what happens when various people try out machine learning versus simulation. Well, <coughs> we also have the dilemma of too much data. On the other hand, I don't have anything in the slide, so maybe there is no dilemma. <laughs> but there is one problem, actually several problems. One is when you have too much data, you can't actually load all the data into core at the same time, so you have to often use sampling-based procedures to, in lieu of that. The other thing, this is an experience I've had on several occasions, is uh, you'll remember uh, there's this famous phrase of George Box, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Well, this is a setting where, yes, all models are wrong, because when you have a lot of data, no model that you try is ever going to fit the data uh, well. In particular, everything will get rejected by whatever hypothesis test you try to throw at it, I had that example uh, in my own personal professional life several years ago when I was building a model for CISNET. CISNET was a group of different uh, universities around the country that were looking at breast cancer incidence and mortality trends. And when you look at population level trends, you're looking at a population of basically the entire uh, female population in the United States. Natural assumption is that they all have independently evolving breast cancer incidences and so forth. That means that you have a sample size of tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of independent individuals. And when you have a sample size that big, the confidence intervals that you get on everything are so tiny that every model gets rejected. So um, that's an <coughs> interesting uh, problem that arise in that context. I'm not sure that there are any good ways of dealing with that, uh, at least that I'm aware of. Let me say a little bit about uh, scenario-based modeling. Um, let me talk about the climate risk issue and discuss that, first of all, in the context of the runway improvements that people and that the San Francisco Ru uh, Airport Authority has been talking about needing to make in the next uh, decade or two. So one of the issues that you have is that the San Francisco airport is built out in the San Francisco Bay, and uh, it, uh, the uh, runways themselves are only sitting about four feet above the bay itself. And the bay itself is sitting at sea level, so if you get a significant sea level increase, uh, you have a, some potential problems. So there are questions arising about uh, when should you spend money or should you spend money to try to increase the level of those uh, try to raise the level of those runways above uh, sea level. And uh, there's pr probably no way to do that. This is not going to be a decision that's going to be based, based purely on data. You're going to have to do some scenario analysis based on climate predictions. So this is an obvious opportunity for scenario-based modeling, not purely data-driven. Financial risk is another such setting. Uh, if you go back to the financial crisis of the 2007 through 2009, that was basically uh, 
mortgage-backed securities were basically what uh, uh, created that uh, financial crisis. And uh, if you were to look purely at the data at that time, back in 2007, well, this was housing data going back to the 1930s. And the mortgage-backed securities that were being issued took advantage of geographical diversification. So in particular, what had been observed historically was there'd never been any simultaneously weakening of the housing markets across all regions in the US that had never been seen back to the 1930s. So that meant that you could produce uh, less risky uh, securities by basically bundling together securities from California, from Florida, from New York, from Texas. If one market went down, the other markets wouldn't go down, maybe they would go up, and you'd basically be able to diversify away all of your risk. So that works fine if you don't have a nationwide housing crisis. Unfortunately, well, some economists actually did say back in 2007, before the uh, worst of the uh, financial crisis began, that it looked like the data was saying it was a nationwide housing bubble, and particularly Robert Schiller of uh, Yale was saying that back well before the layman and so forth went under. And uh, sadly, uh, somebody should have done some scenario analysis there. Somebody should have run these simulations about what indeed would happen if Robert Schiller was correct and you actually got a 10% nationwide uh, housing price decline. Because if you'd done that, you would have easily seen that there were many, many companies who were extremely exposed to a downturn like that and were in great financial peril. So another case where scenario analysis should have been done. A um, couple of last quick points about machine learning and simulation. There's some wonderful synergies that I think we have to take advantage of uh, machine learning and simulation together. One being in the area of approximate dynamic programming where machine learning can provide efficient representations of high dimensional value functions that can then be used in conjunction with simulation and the other in the context of simulation-based training of machine learning systems for self-driving vehicles. So in particular, uh, the self-driving technologies that are being developed are largely based on physical world driving alone. But even the uh, company that's done the most of that, that would be uh, Google's self-driving um, uh, uh, subdivision. I think uh, Waymo uh, is the name of that part of Google. I think that uh, company, at least as of last year, only had about three million miles of actual physical world driving from which they were doing machine learning calibration. Now, if you think about uh, how long it takes, how many miles do you need to drive to get to typical fatal uh, driving collisions? It takes about 50 million miles, roughly speaking, before you see a fatal driving collision. So in three million miles, you're nowhere close to the sample size needed even to see one of those types of events occurring. So there's lots to be done in terms of training these systems. And one way to accelerate the training process is to do build simulators to simulate driving situations and present those simulations to the machine learning systems and then use the simulation generated environments to help support the training. And that is a approach that's being used by a number of the major auto companies to try to accelerate the machine learning uh, discovery process. So just to conclude, uh, I've tried to make the point that the integration of theory from stochastics and the use of statistics, obviously this is an important uh, set of ideas in the context of simulation. In building statistical models, theory can suggest what features to emphasize. Uh, I've been quite clear, I think, about modeling tail risk. Be very skeptical about the limits of quantitative prediction. Don't over predict what quantitative modeling can do. And machine learning will not replace simulation, it will enhance simulation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for a great talk. Um, we have a couple of uh, microphones on each aisle if anybody would like to ask um, any questions. No to the mic, sir. Uh, Peter, on the uh, time scale thing, w the call center coming in and, um, I mean, you could scale the time down to nanoseconds, it didn't buy you anything. You said it was like maybe a three minute period or something that seemed to be 
it, it, right. Yeah. So if you look, if you aggregate the counts and you look at arrival data on a time scale of three minute buckets, and you just have the count statistics relative to three minute buckets, Got you it. basically do as well on looking at performance within the system as having the granular data. So whatever process it is, you just say three minute chunks, whether it's Poisson or not, whatever it is, three minutes gets me what I need to. Right. To so know. If, you, and, if you get that three minute count statistic count uh, process accurately modeled, you'll get very accurate performance prediction. Right. And, there, and as I recall, although I'm too draggy to grok it, there was some sort of theory there that said there is like sort of a resonance of this system that will, is going to tell you what period right. to look so at. Right. So that was exactly correct. It's, uh, that was anticipated by the theory. So there was that many server queue limit theorem. And then when you actually uh, do this through the queue set of experiments, you can see very clearly when you actually look at these experiments that, yeah, it uh, basically makes no difference about what happens at the inter-rival time scale. Yeah. Thanks. So it enormously simplifies your statistical life not to have to worry about that, uh, that level of detail. Um, hello. I'm part of a um, simulation group at a university, and so I would like to know what I have to do to get a copy of your presentation, the video, so that we can show our students, the incoming students every year, what you've just presented. I think it's like uh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. We'll have to talk to Peter Haas here about that. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Thank you. Um, they, they, uh, they, uh, from previous years in the winter simulation archive, I believe there are videos available. I'll sneak in one quick question. Okay. So I think one really, another interesting of the interplay between all of these is uh, data assimilation into simulations. So I was yeah. wondering what your thoughts might be on that. Uh, right, so uh, uh, data assimilation is a, uh, a uh, very uh, topical question. Uh, probably the, the domain in which you see the most sophisticated data assimilation ideas being used is in the context of uh, weather prediction. So in the world of weather prediction, you have big numerical models based on partial differential equations and so forth describing atmospheric physics. But when you solve this uh, partial differential equation as the weather services do, you have to initialize the system. And the problem is that uh, the initialization involves uh, weather conditions not over the entire planet's surface. There are only a limited number of weather monitoring stations. And there are also problems with the fact that the measurements are not taken at all places across the planet simultaneously. So there are some temporal effects. So you need to synthesize and integrate all of this data together, assimilate the data in a way that helps initialize the system. So that is really, at some level, a uh, very challenging and special case of what's called the uh, a uh, filtering problem. So what is it you're trying to do? You have some uh, system dynamics for the uh, system under consideration. You don't get to observe the entire state of the system. You don't get to observe the entire, all of the weather meteor meteorological conditions across the entire planet simultaneously. Uh, so from the limited data that you have, you have to infer an initial condition for the entire system. That's basically the filtering problem. And there are lots of settings also within uh, the, the, the world that we live in where filtering problems of a similar kind are potentially relevant. In particular, if you go back to that real-time simulation issue that I was raising, if you want to do real-time simulations, then what we need to do is we need to simulate the system conditional on the current state. And the problem is that the current state, as it's typically measured in many systems, does not align oftentimes with the simulation current state. So the simulation current state, what we use to drive our discrete event simulations, will have lots of additional uh, state variables in it having to do with amount of elapsed time since the last arrival, amount of time maybe to the next uh, event occurring. Uh, there'll be, you know, if you are using a Markov modulated uh, uh, arrival process, there may be the environmental variable for the Markov modulated arrival process that also sits inside your simulation. So there, the simulation state will often have many more things sitting inside it than you actually get to observe in the real system. So 
that leads to another filtering problem that is uh, also challenging and one that uh, I think to date there's relatively little literature on, but it's something quite uh, interesting to, to think about. Thank you very much. One more time. Thank you very much.